we're going to do our best to social distance and yeah, yeah. but it's just it's it's like such a hard decision to make because that there's always that like lingering what if and i i have my, my grandma passed away from covid this year i mean it, it, Shoot, it, no I, way. I saw i saw it firsthand how bad it could mess somebody up and so it's like yeah but uh i i think you know we just had an just had a negative test on Wednesday, getting tested again on I think Saturday or Monday before we go, and then, you know, yeah, I think it'll be it'll, it'll be all good. But it's just super weird, dude. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. I um a close friend of mine lost their well. I have three people that I know personally that have lost uh, relatives due to COVID, and I have yeah. a, a close family friend. When COVID first started, I had a friend of mine who came back from Spain. And then their dad immediately got it right after she came back. So, you know, there's this thought that he might have gotten it for her. He nearly died. You know, it's it's insane, dude. But yeah. But I mean, you're managing though. You're like, you're you're doing okay, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, of course. It was in July. And I mean, you know, it it, it was awful. Um, But, you know, we all got to say our goodbyes, you know, over the phone and stuff like that. Um, Yeah. You know, but it's just like, it is it is that weird thing where it's like we watched everything go down we all went into quarantine you'd hear little stories from here and there but then you then you see it happen in your family cuz you just you just don't think it's gonna like you yeah. you know most people don't think that way and then and then you see it happen you're just like this thing she went from being okay you know she was quarantined at home after she found out that she got it she was fine yeah. she had like you know the symptoms weren't too bad she lost her sense of taste and sense of smell and then like literally like flipping a light switch she was in the hospital and and lasted about four or five days there and i mean it's just 70 76 76 wow yeah it's my it's like my step-grandma my dad's dad remarried and so she's a bit younger and it's not that old no it's not i said not not in today's standards to be honest no like that's no. pretty average. Like seventy. My parents. Is my parents age. are in their sixties, so wow. you know it's not. That's like ten years difference. And how old are you, if I can ask? I'm thirty-seven. I'm 37. old. Thirty-seven. Wow. <laughs> Dude, honestly, I, I firmly believe like forty is like the new twenty. You know, like there's so many new things that you can do nowadays that you weren't so. able to do. I, I, I know. So. I just turned thirty like two months ago, so I'm in that. Nice. You know, I'm in the thirties now. Happy birthday. I, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate. I don't mind it. I don't mind being thirty. I love it. I think I, it's. 30 to 35 was sweet. <laughs> so the true downhill is after 35, then. That's what you're well, telling Well, you just me. start approaching 40, and you never think you're going to get to 40, and then you're just like, wow, I'm not that far away from 40. You're like, holy shit. I guess that is true when you put it into perspective. I am 10 years away from being 40. And it's funny right. because as a kid, I feel like when you think – so as a kid, I feel like when you think 30s, you think adult. When you think 50s, right. you think like grand grandpa. When you think 40s, you think like – older adult and now i'm like 10 years away from that i'm like shit i don't feel any different but i'm like right around the corner from what i used to think was like an old man holy yeah. shit things oh. things have definitely changed are you in la i'm in la yeah okay yeah things have definitely changed where it's like man I, when we could have parties i'd be at a party and there would be like a, a you know a 21 year old there and then there would be like there's like people in their 50s and they're kind of all doing the same shit some of them might have kids or or be in a different place in their career but everybody's still you know playing the art game doing their thing they're all yeah. sort of generally hip to what's going on or whatever and it's like it's interesting you know LA I feel like makes it a little like you can just it you know not completely but there is that that kind of like you know it's like it's like being at it's like being at a party and you have friends who can't pay rent and you have friends who are millionaires same thing yeah, in LA. You know? Exactly, dude. Like, you know, um, do you mostly work with just music or do you branch off into like different things? I do mostly music. And then I, I actually have a friend of mine who has a successful commercial production company. So I, I work for her as well on a lot of sets. Oh, no so way. S- still in like, still in the LA scene of like doing, you know, you know, freelance gig work. But right. It's um, the LA I lifestyle. I do a lot of that. Yeah, it's a, it's a hustle. Yeah, so we might have actually rubbed shoulders because I, I act on the side too, but I, I don't tell anybody that. Like literally <laughs> all my friends and people that I work with or that they know what I do, they'll be surprised when they see me in a commercial. They're like, what? And I'm like, oh, right. yeah, I, I, don't, I don't post about that. Uh, right. I don't know. I don't know why. I'm like, I do a lot of different things and I'd rather just keep it independent. And music for me, you know, it's a big part of my life. And so when, we, when I do right. this, it's very, it's, it's not 
it's unusual when I meet somebody in music who's like in five other things. You know what I mean? So you might be right. one of the very few that I know who's also in like film and production. So you understand more of those things. I do. And, and I do the same thing. I don't really post about it or talk about it a lot. I mean, it definitely feels more like work than being on tour does or doing music production or whatever. But um, yeah, man, I totally get it. And, and you know, it's, it's LA is an expensive city. And yeah. as, as you and I both know, it becomes, in, it's more increasingly difficult to make a solid living doing music. Yeah, you know, and, and it's getting even more difficult to do that. I think so. I think so. Yeah, dude, like it wasn't like this ten years ago. You know, I, no. again, you're a little older than me, so you have a tiny bit more experience. Because I feel like when you, when did you move out here? By the way, I moved out here. I was like 27, so about 10 years ago. Okay, so yeah, yeah so you moved out here like what, like 2010? Oh, no, no, like 25. So it was like 12 years ago. So like 2008 ish, right? I, yeah, dude, I was just graduating high school. Holy shit! <laughs> uh, um, but like, I feel like straight out of high school and in college, I really started playing more locally. I was mostly involved in like the Hispanic sector of music, you know, because I'm a drummer. Nice. Uh, yeah. And uh, thank you. And I, yeah, I know so that. I, who do you who do you play for? Well, like, they're, they're prim they were primarily like obscure Hispanic groups that would tour a lot like in South America and like Guatemala okay. and all those groups. So you probably won't know who they are, but it was predominantly like contemporary. Like if you ever turn on like Hispanic radio, you hear like very traditional music or like salsa music. Mm -hmm. And then you hear like those contemporary ballads. It was it's mm -hmm. like that that style, you know, like pop ish. But yep. still, like, very contemporary ballad. Like, that's the kind of thing I did. And then later in my adult life, I started playing for more singer-songwriters out here, like, more local artists. But then uh, around, like, my – when I was, like, 25 or 26, I started to just do other things. So I started mm -hmm. playing drums less and doing this podcast and, like, this other business that I have. So now it's, like, a mesh of a lot of different things. But I, I haven't played for anyone, like, super major that you might be aware of. But, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. But I'm really fucking good, though. I'll get, I, I, that. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it dude i've i did some session work for this producer his name was ettore grenzi i think is his name it's been a bunch of years was he but italian we, he was italian but he did he did a lot of like latin pop stuff and i would just do like some sim simple acoustic guitar or you know, simple bass like really easy stuff but he, I wonder, like, if there's some crossover there between, like, the kind of music you were doing, because it was like, it was like ballad -y pop music with, with the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, Spanish vocals and, and, um, you know, yeah, I feel like uh, with Hispanic music in particular, like, now, I, I, first of all, I feel like it's changing severely, like, over the past couple of years. But I feel like for a very long time, especially me growing up, it was very segmented. Like, like I mentioned, you have the, like your traditional Afro-Cuban, which kind of covers like mer like merengue salsa like th th those dancing kind of kind of styles and then you had like your more really folklore type of music like mariachi and like those like really old school ballads and then you have something in between but i always find it interesting how as a hispanic community the pop music really just gravitated towards the ballads you know what i mean right. like there's totally. some there's some exceptions like you have like rock bands like mana and those those things but like in general, a lot of those traditional Hispanic people from like South America and Central America, they love those ballads. And a lot of those roots come from Europe. Like if you mm. really trace them back, they're very like you get some German stuff, you get some Spanish stuff, a lot of Italian stuff. And so it would make sense to me why they would be like uh, why you would work for someone who's Italian, who's very influential in, his, in the Hispanic community. That I mean, that makes he was, sense. To he me. was I think he had won a couple Latin Grammys like he you know, he was definitely you know, I haven't done a session for him in a long time. I don't even know if he still lives in LA, but yeah, he was, I mean, but the thing is, is like, you know, whether, whether I was into the music or not, it was irrelevant. The dude was, a, dude was a monster. He was such a great producer. He was a great vocalist. He was a great piano player. So like, you know, I just enjoy being in the room with guys who are just that good. It's yeah. always inspiring and sort of like, even if it's not, music that I listen to or whatever. It's like, you know, being around a badass musician is being around a badass musician, no matter what the style is. Yeah. Really kicks you into gear too. It really does. Yeah. <laughs> you, th you think you're working hard and then you walk into a room with like a, a like a prodigy or some shit and you're like, what right. the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I got this, I was very lucky to get this gig last year 
playing guitar for Julia Michaels, who's a pop singer. Oh, I love her voice. She's a great yeah, writer. Yes, she, she's a great writer, a great person, great group of people. Like, And, you know, I had been mostly doing rock stuff and, and playing more bass. I wasn't even playing a lot of guitar. I was playing bass and keys. Who were you and, playing for before, uh, Julia Michaels? You were part of a well, band, right? Yeah, I was in a band called Dead Sarah for like seven or eight years. So a, a lot of my time in LA was spent with that band. I was playing bass um, and we were like a female fronted. I mean, they, they're still around. I'm just not in the band anymore, but we were a, f a female fronted uh, like heavy rock band. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, so I did that for, for a long time. And then finally decided to sort of make a move out of that. I mean, we, they're, they're on Warner brothers now, but we had, we did our first record did pretty well. And then we signed to a major label and then, you know, kind of like the usual thing. That yeah, happens. exactly. Yeah, yeah the exactly. The yep. usual. And, um, we did some great tours. We opened for muse like on an arena run in the United States. Like, you know, we, we, it was awesome. And then we kind of got stuck in the, the, you know, major label circle, like, you know, forever writing for two years, trying to, you know, they want to hear that song. And, you know, I kind of burnt out on that and, uh, and, and then started touring and playing with this guy. His name's Josh, but he has a, a project called Mondo Cosmo. Oh, I know Mondo um, Cosmo. He was on the yeah. show. Yeah. Oh, he did. Okay. Yeah. Brad. Yeah. Oh, Mondo's amazing. cool. He's, he's a very he's cool guy. One of my best homies. Um, oh, shout out to you, so, Mondo Cosmo. He's amazing. Yeah, dude. I, I, you know, man, like that guy, like kind of re helped me get re-inspired about music, like being with him and, and, and cause he's like a, he's a believer, like, yeah. like, like in the power of music. Like, I mean, I love music and I believe in it too, but like Josh is on another level when, when you, when you talk music with him on, on how much he believes in it. Um, yeah, he like understands it on this very deep, almost uh, genetic level. I don't know how that makes sense, but yeah. Totally makes sense, yeah. Um, and so that was wonderful, like he, you know, playing with him. And that was, you know, our the band is is hired, but it gets treated like a band. We, you know, we, we, we talk about the set, we, you know, as a band, we talk about the show as a band. Um, we helped him build the live show um, kind of together, and it's, minus switching out drummers here and there it's pretty much been the same core of dudes playing with them for the last few years um and then and that and that one we got to do all the all the cool festivals um and that was all the cool that was festivals some, you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah, it's something, it's, they kind of become bucket listy in a way where it's like i've always yeah. wanted to do outside lands or law you have your or, tiers of festivals you, you exactly. have like the tier one ones that everybody wants to do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was rad. And um, we did some cool opening runs and some cool headline runs. Um, and then, yeah, last year, I just kind of was a slower. He was it was like a writing year for him and a little bit slower. And this this Julia Michaels thing came up. And and like I said, with Dead Sarah I was playing bass and Mondo Cosmo was playing bass and keys. And then so I wasn't, you know, I wasn't just like playing guitar every day or whatever, which I grew up playing guitar. That was my instrument. I didn't grow up playing bass or Right. Um, and so getting back into that gig, I met her band and they are so good. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. pop, pop world good. Like, you know, the drummer and the bass player and every Cami, the keyboard. I mean, they're just, they're on another level. So it's that same thing where you just, you're, you like, at least for me personally, I was like, oh man, I, I got to step it up again. And it, that's inspiring, you know, like, like getting around those people where you're just like you are just so good you know yeah yeah and i don't i don't i also kind of personally believe like i'll never achieve some of the levels that these people's people have achieved but is that endless game with music where there is there is no ceiling you know you can just work and work and work to just whatever it is you're doing if it's you know like the obli stuff which is you know more production based and sample based and and craft based and crafting a, a song or if it's as a player it's like there is no ceiling till the till the day you die you can just keep reaching for things which is kind of wonderful it is wonderful but you ever get intimidated by that idea because that intimidates me sometimes like when i when i really sit to think about that i guess you can say potential but there there really is limitless potential to what a person can do and right. it's really kind of like up to you and like your own life and obstacles that come. It's, it's a big jumble of things that 
kind of determine how far you can go. But even still, like you can literally go incredibly far. Does that ever intimidate you? It it does because I'll 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 hear things by people that I'm just like, you know, especially with doing the obli stuff. Like I'm mixing it, and 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 mixing is its own voodoo craft. Yeah. And and like you'll hear you'll be like, man, I you know, God, I've been working on this for a number of years now and like <laughs> my mixes are getting pretty good. And then you hear another mix sometimes and you're just like what, what? the fuck? <laughs> yes, like literally, it's like what how? Impossible. There's no way that 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 things can be this separated or hit this way or feel this good or and I but then like I, what what you know, you, I guess the two choices are you, you keep pushing or you stop. And I'm always like, well, I'm just going to keep pushing. And it's, and if I think about, if I listen to a mix of mine from two years ago, as a, compared to a mix of mine today, it's night and day. And I'm like, I, well, I've come that far in two years, you know, where will I be in two more years? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I feel like you and I have a very similar story, especially in the sense of production. Um, I started producing maybe about, I mean, I have always been producing, you know, at, for fun, but like, for, like legitimately producing maybe about like a year and a half ago or so. Right. So I, I started teaching myself how to mix. And these are, when you start learning how to mix, you know, you're aware of like the concepts, especially as a musician, like, you know, about right. like frequencies and like compression sure, and all compression, this stuff. Right. But when you sit there with a goal in mind, it's a very completely different game. You got to like figure it out. Um, and I remember for like such a long time, I was listening to different tracks, all kinds of things trying to understand what people were doing and there was one moment where i don't know what it was about this song but once i figured out what was happening it kind of clicked in and i was able to experiment a little bit more freely it was the song um i'm not sure if you've heard it but it's a very popular song uh demi lovato sorry not sorry mm -hmm. you know that song right mm -hmm. okay so when i was dissecting that song i literally looked up so many tutorials on you know how to mix it blah 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 because i knew that it was like there was a fairly simple beat. There's a lot of in, into it, but it's fairly simple, like just keys, 808, beat, that kind of thing. And yeah. then one day I was in the car and I was listening to it again, like full blast. And then there was a split moment where she stopped singing for like a millisecond and then continues on to the chorus or something. Then I mm -hmm. heard in the, in the deep background, I heard this chant of, what do they say in the bridge? It's like a... Um, some whatever anyways whatever ch incantation that they're saying in the bridge i heard it during the verse and deep in the background it was like filtered and distorted and i sat there being like oh my god so right. that's what makes this song sound so full because when you when you look up the instrumental on youtube it sounds rather empty like it sounds good but it's just right. an 808 in a beat i'm like dude it sounded so full on the radio what's the difference and once i found out that the producer i think uh big oak i think it's who produced it um did he, he mix it as well? I, you know, I don't know if he mixed it. That's a good question. He's yeah. he's in all the tutorials, so I was assuming that okay. he mixed it, but he might not have. But okay. whoever chose to like grab the vocal line, and and they distorted it and making they made it sound like a chorus, and they they put it very low in the background throughout the entire song, it made it sound incredibly full. And that moment, right. I started realizing, okay, so there there's little things like that that I can do, that are maybe not necessarily obvious, but I right. can grab little things from the song, put them in the background and see what happens. And that's kind of what changed for me. I know that's kind of like a random tangent, but no, that's what mixing no. is like. It, it, it is. I, um, this kind of like uh, D Dead Sarah, both, both records that I was involved in with Dead Sarah was produced by this guy named Noah Shane. And um, Noah's like a engineer's engineer. Like he, you know, he like everything. I, mostly everything I do is a lot in the box. I have a few pieces of outboard, but mostly in the box. But Noah had like this really. He had, he had racks of gear. He had a, a proper studio, you know. And right. he and he, he really knows his craft. And um, but he would always say like, whatever, whether it was the production part of it or the mixing part of it, he was always like, you know, you're you're just trying to get like. 1% better here, 1% better here, 1% better here. You know, meaning like it is, he was like, it's the layers of everything that you're doing. It's the little things that you're doing when it's the EQ or the compression, or like you said, like, you know, distorting and filtering out a vocal and tucking it underneath the main line or whatever, where as a, most normal listeners aren't going to, they're just going to know that they, you know, they're not going to hear that. They're going to yeah. know that they love the song, but like it's, he was, he would always say like, cause he was like, he, 
you know, he would be the guy who I would be like, Noah, how do I get a, you know, I don't know, a kick to sound good. Like what, how, what, 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 you know, he was the guy, he was the guy I would call if I was like, I don't know what to do with this. Um, I mean, now you're right. Now it is pretty amazing how many tutorials you can go down and how much information you can pick up just going down YouTube rabbit holes on production yeah. and mixing. It's pretty great. Yeah, it's but I pretty pretty great. But you know what's funny is I it, it's so new. Like when you really understand, like when you look at the history of YouTube and then you look at the history of information regarding music production on YouTube, it only goes back like maybe eight nine years. Maybe right. you know, like I think it starts around like two thousand ten ish, and so like oh, for only ten years we've had this ability to kind of teach ourselves. Before then, you'd have to like. Be, you had to call. Yeah, you had to yeah. Call you'd have guy. to call a guy, an engineer, <laughs> yeah. or build your own studio, and then be like, "Okay, I got to buy a shit ton of books now, or just right. do it by ear." Like, holy shit, right? This is yeah. relatively new, and, and it's one of those things that when you really stop to think about it, it can either make you feel really grateful, or it can make you be like, "Holy shit!" Like, this is really overwhelming. Like, that's so right. All this knowledge has, has existed for so long, and yet we're kind of lucky enough that we get to enjoy it in this in this form kind of backtracking a little bit um yeah. i'm wondering did you ever have a moment when you were starting to produce uh and, and doing some of the stuff that you're doing now did you ever mo did you ever have a moment where like it clicked in for you where you were like experimenting with different things uh learning like you were saying kind of getting better one percent here one percent there was there ever a moment where you like felt it come together where you're like oh shit i kind of know what i'm doing to some extent now yeah, yeah yes and yes and no i think like I, I it was like a few years of like i didn't even have a name for the project for for obli i didn't i i just was like making beats and putting in samples and you know using soft synths and some guitar and bass and just like trying to craft tracks and i would be listening to a lot of electronic artists and just like just you know just spending my time making music and for 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 no real reason i would like I was like hoping to release it. And I would even, I even had tracks with where I was trying to sing and, and maybe I would have my vocal be a part of it. And that always ended in, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> nah, I don't know. You know, I'm not sure my voice is quite good enough. Every time, dude, I, I suffer that all the time. I have to hear my voice every fucking day. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I mean, I probably will never, I, I I hate hearing my own voice talk too. I mean, I, I think it is one of those things that most people feel that way about their talking voice, right? I think singing is a little different too in the sense where I'm like, I'm pitchy here, even if I tune it a little bit, it's just like, this is really my singing voice. Like, I don't know, can I just drench it in some effect? It, like, I, you know, it's just so hard to hear your own voice yeah. in any capacity. I think it is personally. Uh, I don't, I'd be, I would love to meet a person who's like, a singer who's like, I love hearing my own voice. I love mm. it. I, I have yet to meet that person. That would be cool to meet somebody who just like loves singing and then listening to it right back. You know, I gotta um, say, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but no, isn't no, that please. interesting? Like, why is it? Because you're absolutely right. Even me, like there are moments where I like listen back and I'm like, okay, I sound okay. But I've never had a moment <laughs> where I'm like, dude, I sound, my Amazing. voice is the greatest <laughs> thing I've ever heard. But see, the funny part is like, I feel like everybody who plays instruments or is a musician to some extent we sort of love what we do. Like, I imagine you enjoy your guitar playing. Sometimes yeah. you might be critical, but sure. overall I feel like you're like, oh, I sound good. When I'm yeah. playing drums, I'm like, oh, that sounded dope. When someone totally. produces a song, I feel like the feeling is mutual too. Like, oh yeah, this is a dope track. But right. you're right. When it comes to the voice, I don't know why as human beings, we like fucking hate it. Why is yeah. that? Why is I that? I don't know, but like, you know, because there's, I'm sure you, you have worked with singers where you're just like, the moment that their mouth opens, you're like, holy fuck, this is amazing. You know, like, I mean, yeah. you, you, there are people who sing like that where it's just like, it's like, it, it stops the air in the room where you're just like, and it is probably the most magical of all things to hear it come out sometimes. It, and, and like, I want to, I want to be the singer who has that effect, who loves hearing their voice. Like, I just, you know, I, I don't, I've never met one that even, even ones that good are usually like, ah, I don't know if I can listen to it back or, uh, or they can only listen to it so many times before they're like, ah, I can't hear it again. Um, it's, it's, it is interesting. Yeah. It's like the one thing that almost every musician or anyone who is inclined with music 
you you can you can bet on that. Like you can bet like yeah. this person will hate their voice. It's just the, it's the common thing, and I don't yeah. know where that comes from. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't uh, know either. But I, I, sorry, not not to interrupt. But I know that we oh, were no, going, no. you were talking about, or I, I was asking you about how like um, if you ever had a moment where you felt like everything kind of came together to some extent. Yeah, I think like I, I did, and I, basically after like a few years of of messing around in Ableton and trying to make tracks and trying to make dance tracks or electronic tracks or use sampling or whatever, and I would, you know, as you do when you're working on a you would have mo- I would have moments over these two or three years where I'd be like, this is really good. And then there's like that test of like playing it for a friend or, or, or whatever. Mm. And I would have those moments. I'd be like, and, and they wouldn't be reacting and I wouldn't be reacting. I'd be like, man, maybe this really isn't that good. And, I, and it would two or three years of that. And then there's a, there's a track that uh, the label that I'm on for and family. Uh, Great that, label, by the way. They're Shout awesome. You guys. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome people. That was one of the first releases this year that I had self-released last year, but it came back out on the label this year called hold you. And I remember, um, I was at my old place and I remember I had like worked on the beat for a while and there were some other elements going on and I had it on a loop and I was actually walking around my old place with uh, a headphone extender plugged into my interface and headphones on and I remember thinking like, I remember thinking like, this is worth putting out. Like, mm. I, I guess I, it clicked, it was clicking enough for me where I was like, this is worth actually, I, like even, I don't even know if the track was done at that point, but like, I just remember thinking like, there's something special enough here and unique enough here. And as hard as that is to be in music and whatever that even can mean anymore with how much music there is out there. I remember thinking like, this is good. Like, and I don't say that often about anything about myself or anything I'm working on. I'm definitely like a lot of people are, you know, overly critical of what I'm working on. Um, And I remember like that level of internal positivity with nobody else in the room was like a kind of a interesting moment. And I, I think that like, I'm sure you have this same stuff is like the more and more, you make music on your own or your music production or whatever. It's the same thing with learning an instrument is you start, you clock enough hours, you start to have this internal sort of thing where you start to know if something is good or not. Does yeah. that make sense? Or like no, it makes perfect sense. Worth, worth playing for somebody else or worth releasing or, or, or whatever. And, and, and I feel like it took me a number of years to even just get that, kind of or at least a foundation of that some like internal sort of like i know you know yeah. there's something there's something here and i don't think there's any way to get there except put in the time yeah I no and i firmly believe in that because i do feel like as creative people and artists there, there there does come a point where we feel like we've put in enough time but what's interesting about your experience is you have or at least if I'm understanding your story correctly, it seems like you came to that understanding on your own. You know, like you worked very hard on your own and one day you lo- you listened back to your project and you just felt like, wow, okay, I'm proud of this and I feel like others might be might dig it. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna believe in this, right? You yeah. you kinda came to that on your own, right? Yeah, I think definitely I think because at the time there was I would there was no label. I was just <laughs> making beats and um and this is what think, like three four years ago no this was like literally probably this was probably early 2019 or late 2018 oh so not that long ago Damn. not that long ago yeah and um i, I yeah i i was really just making it for me and like i was gonna i th- you know at, at, when i kind of felt that good about that track i was like this is one worth releasing and um, I was just going to literally the hopes and dreams for it were to self-release it. And then like, how can I do this live with like a drummer or something? Like, I don't know. I'm like play a small show in LA for my friends. Like that was about as far as I had taken it in my mind. I never thought that a label would be interested or, or that I would have any assistance whatsoever. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, it was a total like, 
I, I'm really enjoying this loop. <laughs> like, like yeah. that's like I, I'm personally by myself in my little guest house, like thoroughly enjoying this loop. And I could listen to it for probably an hour. And it was like kind of like one of those moments where I was like, wow, I've actually like made something that I think is good that I'm enjoying. And, and I really think that's maybe the only yardstick you should have. I don't know. Mm. I, I, it's that, that's, that's, I guess that could be a further unpacking there to maybe that, maybe that's not totally true, but I think that that's one of the most important yardsticks you should have for anything you're making. Um, I like that if, metaphor, if, by the way, if you're, if you're producing for somebody else, maybe, maybe not, you know, there's obviously more people involved then or, or whatever, but if you're making your own stuff, you know, I think, I think that that's, I mean, at least for me, that's like what I got to go off of. It's, it's, it's yeah. wonderful having the label now because there's a sounding board. Cause as, <laughs> yeah. as you know, you get jammed in and you're like, I don't even know if anything is good anymore. That can yeah. happen too. Yeah. It's really nice to have other people. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting, which I wanted to pick your brain about a little bit because, and I, I've said this in the past couple of interviews because I'm start, I'm starting to recognize and I'm, and I'm becoming very grateful over this interesting position that I have kind of found myself in. Uh, and I'm very grateful, you know, you know, all the opportunities I've been given and stuff. Right. But one of the things I'm mostly grateful for is I, I get the opportunity to pick brains of all these differently talented people from different walks of life who are all doing music and it's interesting to see everyone's workflow and every and what inspires different people it's not the same but over over time you start to see that there are similarities across the board you right. remind me of this individual who I, you might already know this person but um i had this guy named jt roach on the show uh okay. and he is a songwriter very very well-known singer very cool guy and he in his story he told me how um, you know, when he first moved out to LA from Minnesota or was it, it might've been Chicago actually. Um, and he, he moved into like a, like a musician's collective, right. Where like different producers and musicians lived in one house. Yeah. And what they started doing is that they started just writing music every day individually. And they would all critique each other's work at the end of the night. And he did that for like a year or two. And right. he feels like that is kind of what helped him get so good at what he does but then I meet people like you who are, you're not alone, by the way. There's plenty of people who have kind of hunkered down and, you know, depending on it doesn't really matter how long it, take, it, it took. But on their own, they kind of just work things out. They learn things. And then one day it just kind of clicked and they're like, wow, I made something good. So right. I find it interesting that there is this sort of polar opposite. There are a lot of people who succeed who need tons of feedback and that, that's not a bad thing it's just it, it propels them but then there's people like you who have kind of like have done it the opposite way where i'm not sure if that was even an opportunity that you had to like have feedback maybe you would have wanted that that's beyond the point the point is you did it on your own and i always find what is the i find interesting like what is what is about what is it about your personality that thrived i guess you can say on listening on your own and kind of building up on your own until one day you just kind of came up with a sweet sauce. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. I mean, I don't, that's a good question. I, I don't know if I know the exact answer of what it is about my personality. I, I, I just, um, I, I think there's like, a. um, it was like, a. it's like, it was the same with guitar, like in, in a way, like, I got, I started playing guitar kind of late compared to some people. I know I, I got a guitar when I was like 14 or 15. Oh, I got my drum set when I was 19, dude. No, Okay. There you go. So you're, you're yeah. more in like the range of me. Like I, I have, I know musician homies in LA who started at like four, age four or five. Yeah. And they're, and they're at that level where you're just like, I can't even, I yeah, can't even. They're yeah. at, where you're currently at, they were, they were at that level when they were like 12. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's insane. Yeah. And some of them started touring when they were like, 16. Right out of high school. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, it's, exactly. And I'm like, I didn't ridiculous. go on my first tour until I was like 27. Um, but like, yeah, I, you know, you're, you're just, you're like not, not good at something. And, and there's like, I, you know, there's a great, there's a great Ira Glass quote about this. And Ira Glass is the, is the um, um, This American Life podcast guy. But he, it's, a, and it's, it's about, um, 
writing, actually. The quote is about writing. But do you care? Mm. Do you care if I read it to you? I I relate By it all to, means, to music. Please do. I mean, I got to pull it up on my phone here. Yeah, please do, man. I don't know if that's weird that I'm reading a quote on on a no, podcast. You know what's funny? Nothing is weird on a podcast. That's what's great about these things. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Good. <laughs> um, all right. Oh, hold on. That's not the right one. I love that you're going to read a quote. I had somebody sing on the oh, podcast once. Like, it was great. <laughs> that's nice. Okay. Hold on. You know what I love about this? It's like, so I, I have, a, because I've been doing this for a while, I, I've, I have like a formality that we have to follow. Um, sure. you know, just to make sure that whoever we have on the show understands like the process and all of that. Um, just, just to be safe. And so that everyone's on the same page. Uh, we didn't do that. <laughs> we, oh, really? Yeah. Like normally I, I would <laughs> chat with you for like 10 minutes and then like, we would like say, okay, three, two, one, let's go. Uh, uh, we just went into it. And so okay. I, just, no, I figured I, that was the case after a few minutes. I was like, Oh, we're probably just rolling now. No, but see, I'm not you, no, 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 dude, this is, I prefer this to be honest <laughs> okay, with you. Cool. I prefer this method, but not everybody's comfortable with it. You know what I mean? So, so like, yeah. thank you for being comfortable with it. <laughs> oh man, dude, thank you for making me feel comfortable. I definitely was like a little nervous. I, I you know, I've just, I've, I've been in bands and I've sat in interviews and, 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 and even chimed in in interviews when I've been in bands, but never been the one being interviewed. So it's always definitely like an interesting, interesting new thing. And I'm, I'm so happy that you would even care to talk to me i think it's amazing we have um, an interesting story and i'm honored to have you on the show man man thank you are you ready for this quote i'm ready okay nobody tells this to people who are beginners i wish someone told me all of us who do creative work we get into it because we have good taste but there is a gap for the first couple of years you make stuff it's just not that good it's trying to be good it has potential but it's not but your taste the thing that got you into the game is still killer and your taste is why your work disappoints you. A lot of people never get past this phase. They quit. Most people I know who do interesting creative work went through years of this. We know our work doesn't have this special thing that we want it to have. We all go through this. And if you are just starting out or you are still in this phase, you got to know it's normal. And the most important thing you can do is do a lot of work. Put yourself on a deadline so that every week you will finish one story. It is only by going through a volume of work that you will close that gap and your work will be as good as your ambitions. And I took longer to figure out how to do this than anyone I've ever met. It's going to take a while. It's normal to take a while. You've just got to fight your way through. Wow. Right? Holy shit. That's deep. Right? Damn. It's, and again, he's a, he's a writer, you know, so it's, it's it, but, but still, like, when I first heard that, I was like, I was like, I started thinking about guitar playing and I was like, you know, it, it took me, I didn't take guitar seriously until I was like maybe 18 or 19 or 20. And then I put in the time, you know, hours, hours a day of practice, hours a day of playing, hours a day of jamming or whatever. And then it, all of a sudden you like, you do, it is like a switch in a way you feel this click and you're like, dude, I'm kind of good. Or like, I, this is, this is like, if, if, if I'm looking up to this circle of musicians, maybe I'm not in the middle of the circle. Maybe I'll never be in the middle of the circle, but I'm like poking at the outside of it. And, and like even that in, in and of itself is an amazing feeling that you're even poking at the outside of being as good as all these people that you've listened to, you know, and idolized or, or at least love their playing or, or love their songs or whatever. And I felt the same way about making beats and using samples and production as I got into all these dudes that I loved. And, and, and it was that same thing where it was like years of work that wasn't quite that good. And, and sometimes I recognized it or sometimes I'd play it for a friend and then I'd recognize it that it wasn't quite that good. Yeah. And then, but, but I, I, I guess I knew because of my experience playing guitar or whatever it, you could, really apply to almost anything in life um i realized that if i just kept going i might it might click you know and, yeah. it, and it, it does eventually if you just keep going you know what's what's interesting about this whole quote which thank you for reading that because that Dude, is a of beautiful course. quote i have tried yeah. to explain that concept in many different ways and i could not ever do it as well as that quote that quote i think <laughs> yeah, expresses it's I, I, I mean it's I, perfect exactly it, it it explains so much with so little and i love that and i find that even within myself like this is stuff that i 
I have gone through myself in life and I've thankfully have learned a lot and have grown from it. But I find that especially in music, maybe maybe in creatives, you know, maybe all creatives kind of go through this, but I do feel it very heavily in music. It's the whole age thing. I'm not sure mm-hmm. if you've ever felt that, but there is this sort of pressure and this sort of expectation that if you're not a certain age or if you're not young, so to speak, and you want to start doing it, it's almost like stupid. You know, it's almost mm-hmm. like people, right. there's this like feeling of like, dude, there's so many young kids, you know, that are way better than you. Right. Don't be naive. Why, why are you doing this? Your time has right. passed. And I find that that is single handedly the, the biggest hurdle that a lot of musicians, producers and stuff have to jump through, especially if you're a little older, especially if you, if you didn't find your style a lot until a lot later, you know, it can right. be incredibly detrimental to your psyche when, 100%. when you feel it. Like, I don't know where that feeling came from, but it's everywhere. It's everywhere in the music industry. Oh I, yeah, dude. I, I mean, if I, I think it's one of those things where it's like, I've had that thought a thousand times and um, and, and, and then I reached a certain point where I just was like, well, there's always going to be somebody younger. There's always going to be somebody better. And I just stopped caring. Like, I just like, I don't know. That's the best way to put it. I just stopped caring because I knew that if I made that the focus, then, then, then that would be the focus. And I, yeah. and, and, and what I, what I accomplish, but if I know that even while well knowing that I know that I'm still going to make music because I love it so much that I just was like, well, I can't make that the focus. I can't make that the thought because what's the point then there is no point, right. you know, the, the, that, that can't be the point. I mean, I do love the competitive side of music. I do. I think that that's healthy in a lot of ways. It's like you see another player play and you're just like, well, man, I got my chops or you see right. a, you hear, you hear a mix and it's the same thing. You're like, well, my chops, I got to like, you know, but that's, that's great. You can just use the healthy part of that to like work harder, you know, do more, study more, learn more, you know, whatever. But if you, the focus has to be about like you and what you're making and like you're yet that person who's 18, who can just like, you know, just crush whatever it is that they're doing. It's like, cool. Well, I mean, that person's 18. They have the influences that they have. They have the music that they've listened to. They have the instruments that they grew up on. And I'm, you know, 37 and I have the bands that I've listened to, the bands that I was in, the experiences that I've had in music, who I've listened to, what I pull from. And so whatever I, I create is uniquely going to be me, whether yeah. his mix is better or my mix is better or this is whatever, whatever, whatever. It's, it's all kind of irrelevant. And I, I don't know. I, 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 again, like, I think it's like, you can't, you, it's, it's, uh, you sort of just have to blast that thought out of your mind a little bit. Yeah. You know, um, it's, I get it, dude. I get dude, it. I, I, I get Still it. Still have the thought every day. <laughs> I, I, I sometimes wonder if it'll ever even go away. Like, just like you, I feel like I've learned how to not focus on that. And really what it came down to is me understanding what I wanted to do because yes. it just, and again, I don't want to make this about me. I hate making it about me, no. but you know, Man, it, come on. it's, it's like our conversation. Right. And you know, for me growing up, um, you know, I always wanted to be a drummer and I wanted to be a jazz drummer. And yep. even though I was fairly good at that, um, you know, I, it didn't work out that well. And so, you know, I started playing drums and blah, blah, blah. But I've always, I always knew that I wanted to do a lot of different things. And I always felt that there was this pressure around me, um, especially the more musicians I met, the more gigs I did, the more tours we went on, you know, the more I got into the world, there mm-hmm. was this constant pressure around me. And again, no one told me this. No one like pointed mm-hmm. my, their finger at me and said, blah, blah, blah. I just felt it that because I was, kind of doing other things there was this feeling that I wasn't focused enough and I, I was never really fully like I don't want to say embraced if that makes sense but my mm-hmm. point is I struggled heavily for like 10 years like through my 20s and I want to say like identity crisis in some way because I always knew I wanted to, wanted to do different things and while I would do them I was never really okay with them and that whole age thing was always part of it and sure. now that I'm like 30 I'm not wise by any mean but I do feel like through my life process and by embracing who I am and what I like and saying, yep. fuck it, like I'm just going to make my own path. 
as yep. cheesy as that sounds, I think that is part of the key of like getting over that whole age thing because you start Definitely. to realize, fuck it, like if it takes me till I'm fifty, till I'm sixty, like I'm just gonna do my thing because this is who I am at my core, and yeah. being something else is just not as fulfilling as just me doing what I want to do, you know. A hundred percent, I, I agree, and 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 like, you know, I I've had this kind of reoccurring thought, and and I think this year has definitely amplified, you know what's what should be important what's important you know and 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 but i've had this recurring thought about this is just like a this is i mean this is about music but this is just about life in general is yeah. like it's about happiness and i was like i was thinking to myself you know like uh, you know there could be a guy who lives in uh, omaha shout out to omaha <laughs> there could be a guy that lives in omaha and he's the manager of a red lobster shout out to red lobster and he's making you know you know 40k a year and he's married to somebody he loves and he has a kid and you could you could i somebody like myself could be like god it's i would never want that life that sounds terrible i don't want to live in omaha and be the manager of a red lobster but like if that dude is happy if he looks if if that's what makes him happy he likes where he works he likes where he lives he loves his family like that's all that matters. Yeah. That is it. And I so love like that. if like if 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 my little project that you know that I get to make music on my laptop and I have an outlet for it and I get to be around my musician homies who I love and we can talk music and listen to music and I get to hopefully knock on wood someday go back on tour and play shows again you know in whatever capacity whether it's with Obli or artists that I get to play for <laughs> Or even if I have to, uh, you know, whatever, it's like, it, it, I have to look at that. And even if it grows no, no larger than it has grown to this point, like, that's pretty great. It's something yeah. to be happy with. I'm, I'm getting to do the things that I love mostly, you know, with a little bit of side hustle here and there. And I don't know, man, I, I, it's, it's easier. It's, it's very easy to say that. It's like a thought that I have to do it in the practice of life and not get have bum out moments or be sad or or think about this or that or whatever you know that's like a different thing it is like a, there's like a, some level of practicing kind of um perspective i guess if that makes yeah. sense no i i love that i love what you're saying because um well excuse me i, I feel like oh my throat <clears throat> my throat has been really weird the past couple of days it's it's the weather man yeah <clears throat> There it is. Okay, now it's clear. <laughs> so <laughs> what what you're saying kind of reminds me of um, – well, it reminds me of two things. Uh, number one, another little secret thing about me, I actually worked in the fashion industry for a long time when I was in college. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, So, but I, I rarely ever talk about it. But uh, through that process, right, of working for these big companies and, like, designing and doing all this stuff, I uh, I met a lot of people in the manufacturing and shipping industry, right? So I, I had to learn all this knowledge to, like – be able to design and do all this stuff. And there was one instance where we met this guy um, from a, logi a logistics company. And for those who might not know or might be randomly interested in shipping, uh, logistics <laughs> is like the whole process of like importing and exporting, you know, like it's like an entire yeah. industry, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, it can be, it, it sounds like it's boring because it's literally just paperwork. You just have to file out, fill out tons of shit so that customs can, you know, Make sure that your package goes to another country or else it'll be blocked and whatnot. So there's this guy that we used to work with. He was like the like a manager or something from one of the, one of those big companies. Very boring company. I just I gotta say that. Logistics sure. is fucking boring. Sure. But this guy, I met him, and after about like two years of us working with this guy, I just picked up on it how happy he was. Like I just felt it. We would go out to sushi, we would like meet up with this guy, and there was something about his demeanor. You could just feel like like this guy was fulfilled. Like he was right. happy. He right. was probably I, I bet he didn't grow up wanting to be a logistics manager, but like he just kept talking about his kids and like how he loved taking rides on his bike on the beach. And I could just sense and one day out of nowhere I just felt it in my brain, like this guy. He's not necessarily doing anything glamorous. Right. Uh, like I'm here trying to push what I'm trying to do. And yet I feel ha like miserable half the time. And I, I, like <laughs> right. I, I want his fulfillment. Like I literally right. sat there in, right. in my brain at the time. I was in my early 20s. It didn't compute. Like how is it that this guy can be doing a boring ass job? 
but right. is incredibly fulfilled and so happy, and he can't wait to like do what he's gonna do. And I'm here trying to do you know the cool thing, and right. I am half miserable all the time. And that there is something to that, as cliche as that sounds. There is something to like really understanding what is really gonna make you happy, and mm-hmm. if you can even do a fraction of that, mm-hmm. then that should be enough, I guess you can say. I would think it's the it, it it's the key. Yeah, like, it's almost the key to to just like I don't you know I don't I, it, it it's, it's mind boggling. It is mind boggling. Yeah, because I I definitely. I mean, same same thing. Like, I I think that with uh, especially with Dead Sarah, I was I was still in my twenties when I was in that band, and I wanted it to be, and we wanted it to be, the biggest fucking band in the world. And we were we were a good live band. I mean, I'm not sure when I how I feel exactly when I listen to our records now, but we were gr- <laughs> we were great live. Like, we yeah. were so good. Emily, the singer unreal voice unreal stage performer like wild woman like i have felt things playing those shows that i have never felt from any drug or any experience or anything you know like they were they were awesome and visceral and real and like so much fun um and we i wanted us to take over the world and i it's like it's it's fun feeling that thought it's like it's it's something worth pursuing to be the biggest band to have all those things like I I was all for it um but there's a part of me there's a part of me now that wishes like I could have been 50 percent less caught up in that and I could have been 50 percent more uh in and enjoying what it was Mm. in the moment you know like the first time we sold out the troubadour the first time we sold out the el rey the first time we went on an arena tour first time holding a vinyl record that we had made like not that i didn't enjoy those moments but when i think about it now it was like you weren't present you weren't like super present yeah i was i was concerned with like being this thing when it's like man i should just be like here with my band who i love uh and uh, we could be the biggest band in the world two years later or we could be broken up two years later and it doesn't matter Mm. you know in a way yeah I think those thoughts. But that's kind of, that's age, age and life perspective. You yeah. just sort of you start to kind of like maybe have a better sense of importances and, and you ever, values. Do you ever wonder if it's impossible to reach that, like king status? You know, like the legendary at top of the world. Do you think it's impossible to reach that without like some sort of misery? You know what I mean? Like, and that's not to be. <laughs> yeah. that, I'm not being no, pessimistic. I'm, I'm sure that there's. I have met plenty of entrepreneurs who are like billionaires, who people right. that you've never heard of, who are right. like legitimately happy. So I know it's possible, but in the music industry, it's glamorized that whole like misery and like the the yeah. the, the sad artists. You know, I don't know, like I, which I fucking hate that concept. But anyways, sure. my point is, as I get older, and as, it seems like as you also learn about life, there is this sort of disconnect between like being present and being happy and like caring so much about wanting the world. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Man. I don't even know if there's an answer. That's, that's the honest yeah, truth. I don't I mean, know. Dude, I, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I think there's gotta be, I think there's gotta, there, <sighs> I don't know. I do think there's gotta be something to, some level of like conflict or something to overcome for, for really good art stuff sometimes. And, and that can, that can be as, that can be like where you were born and how your family was, or it can just be internal, completely internal and emotional and, and, you know, based on your mental health. I, I, uh, but I feel like the answer is like, no, there's probably not anybody that we all look up to as legend legends in music who probably did, you know, didn't have some level of misery to go through. I I feel like there are people who make it through that phase and maybe their great albums came out in that phase, but they, but they got through that phase and they still put out good records and they still have a career. Um, But I don't know, but I, I like to think like the, I think the optimistic side of me is that I like to think that it's also possible to just, love music, make great music, be great at music. And you don't have to have necessarily, and you could just be a happy person who puts out great music, but I I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I know, I I do know that it is possible. I just feel like 
it's a, it's a very hard thing to do, and it takes a lot of courage and a lot of self discovery and confronting you know all the doubts and shit to get there. Like I, I'm very much yeah. a huge. I, I try my best to be as optimistic as possible. I think anything is possible, really. Yeah. But I do feel like it's one of the hardest things you can do is to like really go after it all and find yeah. a way to find peace in that. You know, because I don't know that that's a fucking rabbit hole. But it um, is. by the way, we are kind of reaching the hour mark. I want to respect Dude. your time. Are you okay to keep going for a little bit? Yeah, man, absolutely, hundred percent. Okay, cool. I just, I, I don't want to like disrespect if you got stuff to do. Um, there was know- a great. I just on that note, I'll say that the, anybody who wants to go listen to it, uh, there's a not. I you know there. Do you know this podcast, Broken Record, with Rick Rubin? Yes. And Malcolm Gladwell. Okay, so there was a, a Rick Rubin and Andre Three Thousand interview that where they dive super deep into that. Yeah. Uh, into success and happiness it is so worth a listen. Anyway, shout I'll out, just say, sh- leave it there. Yeah. yeah. No, no, shout out to that <laughs> podcast. I mean, I feel yeah. like they, they would do a way better job than, with, than I could because it's no, like. No, and I don't want to be saying I should, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned another podcast. No, 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 podcast. by all I'm means. Sorry if I did. Okay, okay. I just think nah. it's as a musician and whatever, it's, it's a one, it's or just in, in just whatever in general it is it's such a great listen that one. knowledge knowledge is knowledge and i think yeah. the whole point of it all is to really try it and help and understand the creative mind and push all yeah. of us forward you know one Definitely. thing I, I, one thing i'm wondering um kind of backtracking a little bit we were talking about you know the whole age thing and, and those expectations and you found yourself getting back into um electronic music you know even though you're an instrumentalist and you've played for like rock bands and uh Mondo Cosmo, who's kind of like a, a songwriter, so to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then you kind of jump back into this um, electronic world. And one of the things that I've noticed, again, kind of telling you a little bit of my history, I coming from the Hispanic world and from like playing with singer songwriters and, and just being all about jazz and drumming and that stuff. When I got introduced to electronic music like two three years ago it blew my mind not Mm -hmm. like just what i heard it was just a different atmosphere everything about it was unique to me but one thing that i picked up early on which i'm not sure if it's true it could just be what i noticed but maybe i'm completely wrong and i'm hoping you can correct me but to me it seems like in the electronic world where you make beats and you make all kinds of different sub genres of electronic music i've seen plenty of artists um, or DJs or producers, however you want to classify them, who are so to like middle aged versus mm. just being like teenagers. And whereas like in the world that I came from, um, a, a lot of them happen to be very very young, you know, early twenties. Um, in the Hispanic world, it's a little bit different too. But at least in like the American market, what I've noticed is when it comes to like pop acts and the traditional music that a lot of us like, um, the people who are middle aged are like really established they've been around for a long time but right. often the the what the pop makers are like young but that doesn't seem to be the case as often in like electronic music it seems like if you're just a dope producer and you happen right. to be 45 or 50 years old people <laughs> yeah. would people would dig that people would be like holy right. shit look at look at this 50 year old dude making this sick ass right. beat you know what i mean and so like i don't know do you oh, get that I have feeling to believe that's true i have to believe that's true <laughs> that is true that is true uh yeah, I well, I I sometimes think I make these like I'll make a. Dis- I remember when I first discovered Fortet, uh, who was one of my favorite. Fortet's a, a guy named Kieran Hebden. He's a he's an English producer and he was a DJ forever. He was a DJ first before he was like a electronic music producer, and it's mostly instrumental. And it's really one of my he's one of my favorite electronic producers. Like I think I discovered him on his like his fourth record. So yeah. he you know so like. I feel like there's maybe dudes who get to build it for a while and, and maybe it's just only within certain scenes or certain circles and it get, it gets to you when it gets to you and you're like, you know, I don't, I don't know how old he is. He's probably in his forties or something like that now. But I, 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 uh, I feel like that happens to me sometimes where I'll make a discovery um, and, and be like, Oh wow. I like, I love this record. I love this music. What is this? And then I'll go finally like, take the time to to look at look it up and um who, who you know see their history or their just discography and it's like oh man this dude's been this dude's Killing been putting out music while. for a yeah. decade yeah a decade yeah. I'm, I'm just finally catching up yeah um, that might could be part of it but um yeah and then some of these guys that like you know they they've been doing it like dj shadow's still putting out records that dude's been doing it forever 
I mean, forever. Like how long? You know, so like 20 plus years? 20 plus years. Jesus. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. I'm, I mean, they were sampling when it was real like yeah. full fully sampling off of st- like those you know. old school mini uh tape machines and stuff yes like, yeah damn yeah. i've seen some yeah. of those videos dude that's sick shit like um yeah there's this video of this guy and i don't i can't remember his name but it's a very popular youtube video um i think it was in was it in europe or in detroit but there's this guy who's just he has this little mini tape machine and he's just doing a full-on like half an hour set just going from tape to tape and manipulating the little tapes with his fingers to like make sounds and shit. It wow. is dope ass shit. Like what you had to do back then to right. like make all that to make like a set. You know? Ah, yeah. Man. He DJ Shadow. I I could be wrong. It's probably worth you know side checking. But he has a record called Introducing. So it's it's spelled like Introducing, but it's Entro like with an E. So Introducing. And I think it is the first and first record i don't that to be made fully like only from sampling like mm. only like pre and pre all the you know uh, e- how easy it is now like literally every sound on the record was sampled but he's he's put them all together to make these amazing tracks and amazing songs and like that's like if you hold that mark what a what a like what an amazing thing to have accomplished to be the first guy to make a record solely from solely from sampling there is not one created sound on there um wow you know that's kind of it's i mean i want to verify what i'm saying right now because this is <laughs> go, go out, but I, in, this, uh, in this day and age man you're going to read in the comments oh actually that's not actually true. bro no dude <laughs> this guy did it yeah. oh jesus dude you know it's crazy because i feel like uh and why you look that up it's interesting because it's it is composed almost entirely of samples that's close so enough. i was wrong that's good enough for me okay though. that's good enough for i mean me. it came out it came out in 96 so it's 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 you know it's pre like the ease of making music digitally you yeah know? yeah that was around the cusp man that's like right as it was starting to transition to like the what was it like the digital tapes uh, like, yep. With like the DATs, I think they were called. Um, yeah, DAT. Yeah. DAT. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Oh my God. All that shit. But one thing that I'm curious about you, because again, we have a very similar story, even though you're you're a little more experienced than me. Um, you went from like, you know, playing guitar, being in rock bands, songwriter, and you transitioned to electronic music. And I'm wondering what was it about it that really caught your attention. And the reason why I ask, electronic music is is more accepted now than it's ever been. It's mainstream now, right? Yeah, and for sure. And I, de- I definitely came on the scene when it was mainstream. So I'm not claiming that I was like an early adopter or that I was a cool kid who liked it early. Like, no, I, I liked it when it was popular. But, you know, I feel like as a drummer and as a musician's musician for a long time, there was this sort of like, I don't, know, I don't want to say pride thing, but I was very picky with the genres that I liked. And then when electronic music came for me, it turned my whole music world upside down and I loved it. And I'm wondering for you, like, what was it about it that made you want to start experimenting and making electronic music, especially as a guitarist, as a bassist, who probably, you know, grew up listening to a lot of rock music, I'm rock assuming. Rock bands, yeah. 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 What led you to do electronic music? Because right now that's still a lot of musicians are starting to like get into it. But it's yeah. still not really. I, you, I feel like you know this firsthand. Like a lot of musician musicians aren't really into it as much as like someone like you and me. So like, what was it that really drew your attention to it? That, um, that's a great question. I, I think I think for me it was like I think there was there. You know the way Dead Sarah wrote. We wrote as a band, and um, and you know if you're in a band or you've been in a band, you know what it's like to write as a band. Sometimes it can be great and the collaboration can be wonderful and amazing. And we were like literally wrote, you know, we had our lockout in North Hollywood and we just like, we would jam. That's how a lot of the songs came about is we would just be jamming, we would record, we'd listen back to it, you know, and we try to kind of craft something around that. And um, I started to sort of like, you know, after doing that for a number of years and then also feeling like maybe I, I, you know, within that band wasn't maybe valued and or listened to maybe as much as I would have liked. 
um, you know, bands can be difficult. The bands can be tough. And I, I was like, you know, listening to guys like Fortet or guys like Caribou or guys like Shlomo or just whatever people, people would be playing me, you know, friends of mine would be playing me electronic music. And then I'd be like, man, these guys get to just make this all on their own. Yeah. You know? And like, how like i don't what what if i don't need anybody else uh, and and it's funny that's kind of like what i mean besides getting i you know i i was in a band with sonny moore for a couple of years when i first came to la and he was the one who introduced me to ableton and that's the program i still use today so i was Damn. already familiar with making music in ableton i mean he took it to obviously a whole nother level um you know, and, and, and still to this day is just the ultimate fucking badass. But, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I was familiar enough with Ableton while I was still playing in these bands to like mess around making music on my own, but I never took it that seriously or maybe put that much time into it. So then towards the end of Dead Sarah, I think that's when I started to go way more into it is like I wanted the, the almost therapy, if you will, of making it on my own and being yeah. by myself and not having to really, there was no label. I had, you know, nobody's going to have any say in this except for me. Um, and it's funny now that I've done it for a number of years and I actually, there's some assistance with foreign family and like having a, a label and, you know, even the possibility of taking Obli to doing something live and, and whatever. I actually am starting to come around to the idea of like, I'd actually like for these next round of tracks or, I'd actually like to do more collaboration. I think I've gotten that out of my system, if that makes sense. Yeah. Where I've like holed up alone and made a lot of music on my on my own, and that has its limitations as well. So I'm kind of like, how can I, moving forward, how can I be more collaborative? Um, I think that's what was, that was one of the biggest driving forces was all these dudes music that I was loving and listening to, I was just like, they doing, they're doing it on their own. And that was super appealing to me as well. Yeah. No. And I, I love your story, man, because, and by the way, for some of those of you who um, uh, might not know, Sonny Moore is Skrillex. Skrillex. Right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So Skrillex, yeah. Skrillex definitely changed the game. And I, I shout out to Skrillex, you know, not sure if he's tuning in, but anyways, <laughs> <laughs> but my, my point being is that there is like um, my experience, for example, was not necessarily like the production side of things when I first listened to music. I, I found myself at the time, like just like you, how you were like with Dead Sarah, um, things were coming to an end. You were kind of trying to find an outlet for your creativity, I, I would guess. Um, at the time, the project that I was part of at the time, it was starting to hit, not, not a roadblock because we were doing just fine, but there was this sort of inner, there was a lot of, I don't want to say confusion, but I was at a point where musically I wasn't satisfied, if that makes sense. Like after playing yeah, drums for it. a while. Totally. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. After playing drums yep. for a while and doing quote unquote what I was supposed to, there was just this like inner feeling like I'm just not digging this anymore. And I didn't want to admit right. it to myself, but I knew right. like in a deep level. And when I got introduced to um to like EDM and stuff, I to me, as a drummer who like is classically trained and can read music and all this shit. And then seeing a group of people who half of them are not musically educated, half of them right. are, but yeah. they're like creating this <laughs> right. awesome shit that makes me feel like good. I'm like, dude, I have all these years of experience and I don't even feel half as free as that. And I, right. I immediately like wanted to explore that. And I think That's that awesome. for me that, yeah. And I, I mean, I appreciate you saying that. And it's to me, I feel like as musicians, it doesn't really have to be EDM. It could be anything, but I do feel like after a while, it is very common as a creative to like not necessarily hit a rut, but when you want to learn how to do something, it can be very easy to fall into these little, little traps of what you're yeah. supposed to do. And totally. breaking and breaking out of it, you sometimes need that like random weird ass shit to like break you out so you can find a new way of doing something, you know? And trust me, dude, being a drummer who is like, you know, comes from jazz and, and plays pop and shit, who's into like electronic music at the time wasn't that cool. Now it's starting to be kind of cool, but like right. even just two, three years ago, it was still kind of like you're into that. That That's kind of odd. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. I think I've, I've had a few people who've like knew me from dead Sarah and that's really what they knew me as. They knew me as bass player in dead Sarah. And 
uh, you know, even friends here in LA, and then they would, they've maybe either now or, you know, in the last year or two have like listened to what I'm making and they would be like, oh, wow, that's cool. That's what you're making? Electronic music? Like dance music? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. they're like, they, they're surprised, you know, it's almost like they tend to think that, oh, bass player in a rock band, dude must love rock. And that's all he loves is playing rock and roll. And it's like, I mean, you know, no music is music. I mean, you just, yeah. uh, I, you, there's all kinds to love and make and, and whatever. Um, it's, yeah. it's, it's just a funny thing. So what genre did you find yourself starting to make when you started getting into electronic music or like for Obli, for example, like what, what do you classify it as? I don't know. That's, that's hard. Uh, I, I, cause I, I definitely, I, I guess I just call it electronic music, but I think it's like, it, it can be sort of, um, funky and dancey and it can be a little like pretty and ambient and beautiful and and uh, to be honest I'm still trying to just sort of figure out exactly what it is but I you know it definitely feels like an amalgamation of like all of the things that I love and listen to um and you know it I think going forward too there's like a I want to try to I don't know I kind of want to hone it in a little bit more you know yeah. because but also I don't know. Maybe I don't have to exactly. I'm, I'm, I, I definitely use a lot of, I think I use vocal samples often to be the main or chopped up vocal samples or whatever to be like the main hook or the main whatever. And I think that's one thing that ties, ties my music kind of all together. Yeah. Um, it's some, something I've always really just dug is chopped up samples and tweet samples and stuff like that. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I love that you are trying to find actually it, not even sure if you even need to try and find it because nowadays, you know, genres just blend in so much, you know, they all kind of mesh together at this point, but right. I do feel like there, there is something to being in this place where you can just try and, and uh, just, I don't know, just, just create whatever you want. And at some point it will evolve and take form into something that you might be able to classify, but I've listened to, to your track, I think, hold it is the one that I, I true that I tuned yeah. into. It sounds nice. great. Super groovy. Something I can jump to. It's great. Thank you. Nice. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, dude. And so to kind of like, uh, I do appreciate your honesty and your time and um, dude, just sharing ideas. I know. I mean, I, this, the feeling is mutual because this is what it's all about for me. Like at the end of the day, we're all creatives, you know, some people tune in on the show who are not musicians, but it's right. like we all want to create and we want all want to make cool stuff that we're proud of. And at the end of the day, what helps us do that is to be in the right state of mind. I firmly believe yeah. that. And I think these exchanges, exchanges of ideas are the keys to helping us do that. So I do appreciate you being willing to be vulnerable, talk about your opinions and your thoughts, because that's ultimately what helps everyone, you know? Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. And thank you. It's the same. I mean, I, I, I like, uh, I've got a few other things I got to do today, but after talking to you, I'm like, damn, I wish I could go straight to the laptop and just start making some stuff. Like, <laughs> this is me. wonderful, dude. Yeah. I, I feel like that all the time. All right, man. Well, <laughs> I know that we, we've kind of running out of time here. So I want to oh, ask bro. you real quick. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Cool. I love, I love being able to take our time. Um, what projects do you have in the horizon? I know you mentioned that you want to, that you're open to more collaborations. You've got some singles out. Is there anything that you are, do you have like a hard deadline on? Is there something in the horizon that you're going to be putting out? Yeah, no, no hard, no hard deadline. There was, um, I'm not sure exactly will, when this will air, but, um, you know, my, my, my debut EP that's out on foreign family came out last week. Um, so that's out now that has that track, hold it on it. Plus three others. Um, super proud of that one. There's a couple of remixes that'll come out in 20 early 2021 that I'm just wrapping up. Yeah. And then, um, and then, yeah, like just trying to figure out what is the plan for Obli in 2021. I mean, you know, I, definitely more music will come out for sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it'll be a full length or if it'll be more singles. Um, and I, one of the more than anything, I want to figure out how to present Obli live because that's the world that I come from. So I'm excited about that. Mm. Again, knock, knock on wood that we're, we've got shows that look like shows. In yeah, 20, <laughs> in 2021. Yeah, you know, knock yeah. on wood. Knock yeah. on wood. So, are you thinking of a of a band, or are you thinking more like solo stuff? I don't know. I think I kind of, t uh, to be honest, I don't know. I think I kind of want to have a setup for both because I think it would be super rad to at least have a drummer 
if not another musician. But then I think there'll be position. I'll be put in positions where it's like, well, it's easy to just do this by myself, right? You know, and then how can I do that? And and how can I make the tracks different live and be their own performances um, and be their be their own thing and stretch things out. Um, I love that about like my old band Dead Sarah. We you know that was one. We were good live and we had moments where we would stretch and we would improvise and I, there's nothing like it. So I'm, I want to try to bring some of that to the live show where it feels not just like space bar you know and let right. something play right i love that and i love that you're finding a way to to mesh both and to be flexible and adaptive and everything everything that you're doing is cool your music is good and thanks bro the fact thank that your you. head your head is on right i, I would say thanks, so dude. i think thank that's you, gonna man. help you i really appreciate that thank you for being on the show chris i really do appreciate it man and i'm wishing you all the best thanks bro thank you for having me i really really appreciate it